During post-World War I, a 23-year-old Utah woman ventured 7,000 miles to China, where conflicts among the nationalist government, the Communist Party, regional warlords, and the Empire of Japan led to endless wars. Her name? Helen Foster Snow. As a two-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee for her extraordinary communication efforts, Helen Foster Snow reported the truth, conceptualized the industrial cooperatives, wrote over 60 books and 27 manuscripts, and most importantly, built the bridge between the United States and China. Equality was her key to communication. Helen was born on September 21st, 1907, in Cedar City, Utah. At a young age, her mother brought her to a women's suffrage parade in Chicago. Helen's interpersonal and linguistic intelligence was nurtured by the right to justice. Helen Foster, her grandparents, all four of them were pioneers. So who Helen is, is very much shaped by those people's choices. Shortly after Helen took the unlikely step of seeking work in war-torn China in 1931, she met Edgar Snow, a fellow American journalist, as well as her future husband. Her first report to the Western world was on the Yenza River flood as a foreign correspondent of the Seattle Star. She also interviewed the frontier of the January 28th incident, a military conflict following the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Her pen, typewriter, and camera broke an entrenched stereotype of China and gained international attention. Her gifts to understanding the plight of those impacted obtained friends, from labor workers to intellectuals like Song Qingling and Lu Xun, the leading left-wing figure of Chinese literature. While preparing a book called Living China, Helen created a mile-long question list for Lu Xun. Throughout his guidance, she comprehended the amazing beauty of the nation's heritage underneath the bloody scars. Helen respected him as the key to unlocking China, and likewise, Lu Xin applauded the snows for loving China even more than the Chinese. In the December 9th incident in 1935, Helen marched in and documented the event where over 800 students marched in Beijing to protest against Japanese imperialist aggression. This movement inspired 65 other demonstrations in 32 cities across China, with about 10,000 student participants. By reporting these events firsthand in articles like On the Student Front in Peiping, Helen not only brought the situation to the awareness of the American public, but also enhanced the status and potential of patriotic students. However, in Miss Kelly Ann Long's book, Helen Foster Snow, An American Woman in Revolutionary China, it is stated that the open journalism brought them the danger of censorship and persecution by both the Nationalist Party and Japanese forces. To gather authentic news beyond the government blockade, in April of 1937, Helen took the risky tour to Yan'an, the mysterious capital of the Chinese communists. The crown jewel of the journey was interviewing Mao Zedong, the leader of the party who, 12 years later, would become the first president of the People's Republic of China. The letters between the snows disclosed that Helen adapted to the context of her meetings to skillfully raise Mao's interest in philosophy. Their mutual association and discussions led to Mao writing his two military masterpieces, On Contradiction and On Practice. When Mao finished his famous strategy, 10 Guidelines for Anti-Japanese and National Salvation, Helen was the first foreign journalist to receive a copy. To form good communication, both parties must exchange information equally. In Yan'an, Helen compared the Long March, a 6,000 mile long trek done by communists to evade the Nationalist Party, to the trek west of Mormon pioneers in America. Along her way, she befriended female soldiers, civilians, and even taught kids how to tap dance. When Helen left Yan'an, she noticed 
Guo Xinhua, her bodyguard, silently weeping. She wrote, The Great Wall between China and the rest of the world seems very far away. Never would I do anything to break this special relationship, woven of such a few fragile threads in a world where merciless swords cut at international understanding and natural human identities. I think she could see that uh, what her ancestors had done was kind of a mini uh, long march. She understood, you know, the trials that they had gone through. So I, I, I think that made her really appreciate uh, China's history uh, as it was unfolding right before her eyes. It was something that she, had, you know, she had seen uh, or, you know, had a personal connection to uh, in a small way from her own family uh, background. In June of 1937, she sent 20 photo films and 14 interview notebooks to Edgar, just in time for the final stage of his book, Westward Journey, which was so popular that over 10,000 books of the first edition sold out in the Western world. Helen documented her experience in her book, Inside Red China, a companion book to Edgar's. These books recorded informative facts, exposed the combatant power of the Red Army, and influenced Western opinions. Motivated by the snows, thousands of youth in China and overseas went to Yan'an. Furthermore, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt invited Helen and Edgar to the White House for more insight. On July 22, 1944, President Roosevelt launched the Dixie Mission to send a U.S. Army observation group to Yan'an following in Helen's footsteps, which marked the first U.S. effort to establish the official communication channel with the Communist Party of China, making the military value of the Red Army utilize the world's anti-fascist war. After my visit there, that uh, I thought that they would probably win in China. Uh, and uh, the reason I think that that would happen is that they had the popular support. However, the Nationals government refused to file this mission. The U.S. strategic and political framework towards China was eventually reshaped. In 1972, President Richard Nixon's visit to China was an important ice-breaking overture after years of diplomatic isolation. He used the Book of Snows as reference. Uh, whether they are physical walls like this, or whether they are other walls of ideology or philosophy, uh, will not divide peoples in the world. Uh, that peoples, regardless of their differences in backgrounds and their philosophies, will have an opportunity to communicate with each, with each other, to know each other, uh, and to share with each other uh, those particular endeavors that will mean peaceful progress in the years ahead. Helen organized the industrial cooperatives called the Gong Movement in 1938. By working together, it created jobs for millions of destitute individuals in China, India, Sweden, the Philippines, Burma, the United States, and even Japan. Her followers included Song's sisters and Eleanor Roosevelt. Within one year, over a thousand cooperatives were functioning with 15,625 members. Professor Kazutaka Kikuchi, a Japanese historian, credited Helen on Gongha for building up a solid economic foundation for all the post-war countries. And for me, Gung Ho is about understanding the person across the table. So I don't speak Chinese and, and they speak English a little, you know. It was, it was difficult to understand and, and communicate. But the more I got to know them personally, and their point of view and the way they see the world, it allows us to, to work together better. Helen's key to communication was her fight for equality. She spared no effort to ensure that the people around her would have the same rights, status, and opportunity to voice their opinions and enjoy their freedom.